Hello, this is Kyle, also known as AlienTude, and today I have a special sword to review. This is the Todd's Workshop Rith and Hilt sword. Now, I did not buy this sword. It is owned by my friend, the Levin Lance, Nate, and he sent it to me to review and then send it back to him. This is one of the crown jewels of his collection, so thank you, Nate, for your generosity. Now, Nate likes the entire Rith and Hilt concept so much you can tell it speaks to him because he's designed a bunch of different weapons that feature this this uh, geometry and in fact he's actually commissioned I think it's two different versions of this type of this sword from Perna Darnall so it's obvious this is his this is his go-to for a decorative design and functional design too and it just really does speak to him. Now, the cost of this sword is a little complicated. First off, it's all in British pounds, since the maker is based in the UK. And while there's conversions on the website, it's, you know, it goes, it changes as currency changes. But for, at the time of recording, the base price of this sword is about $3,900. And then with the ebony hilt and gilded bronze finish on the furniture, that brings it up to around $4,700. And then there's also a scabbard, which from what I can see, looks like it's about $700 on Todd's website. So altogether, this is around a $5,600 sword, including the scabbard. This is one of the most expensive swords I have ever reviewed, second only to the Howard Clark L6 Katana. Reviewing swords in this price range is kind of tricky because you're not paying just for functionality, you are paying for aesthetics as well. So let's see what you get for $5,600. Let's start this review by talking about the maker, Todd's Workshop. It is run by Todd in the UK and he is a craftsman that makes a wide variety of medieval and later inspired objects. We're talking swords, knives, daggers, crossbows, a trebuchet, just a wide variety of stuff. And he is also a prop maker for Hollywood. He made a good number of sword props for Netflix's The Witcher series. And if you're watching this channel, you're probably already familiar with his YouTube channel as well, It where he goes into all sorts of really cool explorations of historical weapons and especially archery and you've probably seen his arrows versus armor videos but if not I highly recommend checking them out. Todd has two shops on the web. Todd's Workshop where this sword came from and Todd Cutler. The workshop is where he sells his handcrafted items, things he makes himself and as you can probably guess from the breakdown of price on this sword it's expensive. Todd is a busy man and his time it does not come cheap. Todd Cutler is the much more budget-oriented version of his shop and it's not handmade by him. Most of the stuff there is going to be imported. Uh, the blades for the daggers and I believe the sword, the new swords as well are probably imported from India and then assembled in the UK. He has again a wide variety of stuff focused on daggers, but also stuff like the hilt comp or the scabbard components that he uses for his scabbards, and just a wide variety of stuff, much more affordably priced than his workshop stuff, but again, not made by him by hand. This sword is a reproduction of a famous one on display in the Royal Armories. Ewart Oakshot documented it as the as 18.9 in Records of the Medieval Sword, and the rithening on the hilt, the kind of twisted pattern, is a pretty popular design to Germanic swords in the early 16th century. In fact, Emperor Maximilian I seemed to be especially fond of it. And I should mention that the sword in the Royal Armories is not the only one that features this very unique hilt. There are a couple others in a museum in Portugal. 
Let's take a look at the original. The Royal Armories has some great pictures of it, which is just so good to see so I can really get in there and look and appreciate the sword for what it is. When Oakshot documented the sword, he stated that the crossguard and pommel were gilded iron. However, Todd released a video where he described it as gilded bronze and pointed out some casting flaws on the crossguard that made him think that. And the Royal Armories has it listed as gilded bronze as well. I don't know what the original is, but in any case, this specific sword, it is gilded bronze. When looking closely at the original, this sword shows one of the primary differences between the medieval aesthetic and the modern day aesthetic, because the original has a lot of wonkiness to it. There's casting flaws, there's uh, asymmetries, there's wobbling in the blade. There's just a lot of things that a lot of modern people would consider flaws, but medieval people, it wasn't important to them. The reproduction made by Todd's workshop has corrected a lot of those. You know, Todd makes swords for the modern audience, but at the same time, he wants to capture that medieval feel. So there are still some asymmetries and flaws and, and such in the reproduction, but not nearly to the degree that the original has. One kind of interesting thing I noticed when looking at these photos of the original is right on the blade, right at the cross guard, you can see a triangular hexagonal section. This is actually very similar to a feature that Chris Fields of Sterling Armory puts on pretty much all his swords. And it's something that you don't see that often in reproductions these days. I asked Chris about this and he said it's something that's relatively common on historical type 15 and 18 swords. And some of them, the, that transition is hidden within the cross guard, some of them on the blade. It's not something you see on, like I said, on reproductions very often these days, and the reproduction from Todd doesn't have it. It's not really a big deal, just something I kind of noticed. Going back to Oakshot's typing of the sword, he classified it as a type 18, 18.9 in records of the medieval sword. I think the general consensus now is that this would be more of an 18A though, and that's primarily due to the longer grip and pretty slender blade. This type of sword would have been seen the most in the mid 14th into the early 15th century, although that can be expanded just in general because that's just a, a general time frame, not the full only time that these swords were seen. They were going to be cut and thrust balanced swords depending on the geometry. Some of them would be more cut focused, some would be more thrust focused. This one with the very slender blade is definitely more thrust focused than cut. That's not to say it can't cut, just that it's more focused on the thrust. The grip lengths on these types of swords would range from single hand up to hand and a half. Generally speaking, 18A would be closer to hand and a half, although you can certainly have some that are much shorter grips. They sometimes have a very short fuller in the base. You can see this on, say, the famous Brescia Spadona. And they would typically have a flattened diamond cross section or perhaps hollow ground. Now the original, due to its rather ornate and frankly flamboyant appearance, to me says that it was probably owned by a rich nobleman and it was probably a riding sword. I don't think it was really designed as a sword of war because it's a, just a little bit more elaborate than I would expect for something that was going to be used like that. I think this would be more likely to be something that worn to show off wealth. So let's take a look at the scabbard with this sword. One of Todd's most popular products is his scabbards. You can buy scabbards for a good number of Albion models that he has on hand, so you don't need to send him the sword. And from what I experienced, I have one scabbard from him. His turnaround time is around two months for a scabbard, which is actually quite fast in the business. So that's a good deal. However, the prices are a little high compared to other scabbard makers for pretty simple scabbards. These are very good looking, but plain scabbards. They do usually have some nice cast bronze pieces, but you don't get, by default, at, for the price of the scabbards, you don't get much decoration. This just has a couple grooves cut down the, the end, and that's really about it. The belt has a little bit of decoration on it. But 
it depends on what you want, of course. These are historically constructed. They are slender the way medieval swords, scabbards should be. And they look really nice, just a little bit plain. Now, the fit here is pretty good. There's only a tiny bit of rattle. If I shake it, I doubt you're even going to hear it because there's not really any audible. It's more a feel of a little bit of rattle right up here. Uh, there is pretty much no retention, though. I, I can't, you, you can see, I can't even hold it upside down without it sliding out. And I'll test that on both sides here. Yeah, no retention at all. That, I would prefer a bit more retention. Doesn't need to be like super tight. In fact, looser is better than too tight. My personal preference is enough retention that if I hold it upside down, it doesn't just fall out. I would like it to be held upside down. If I shake it, it'll slide out. Or And then if I draw it, obviously draws out very easily. It's a large matter of preference. And again, too loose is better than too tight because if the scabbard does start tightening up or if, heaven forbid, you get some water in there and it seizes up, you don't want the sword stuck in the scabbard. So, you know, that's a big, uh, that's a big matter of preference. Overall, I like the scabbard. It's attractive. It's a little plain for how ornate the sword is. And Nate, buddy, I am calling you out on the color. With all the options available, you chose brown? Really? For everybody else, that's an inside joke. Let's take a look at the ornate hilt. And there's a lot to talk about here. So I'll start with the pommel and move my way through the hilt. It, this is, pommel is the iconic Rithin style with these kind of branches sticking out in an asymmetrical manner. Now these are bronze and gilded. And as I mentioned earlier, Todd likes to keep something of a handmade aesthetic to kind of call out the way the medieval aesthetic was. And that's very visible on this pommel. There are a few spots where there's little pits in the the casting and just not fully perfect. It's not, that's not his design goal. He is not trying to make things look perfect. So that's visible on the pommel and frankly throughout most of the sword. And personally, for my taste at this price range, there's a more flaws than I would prefer. That's my aesthetic choice, however, and it could be, that, that's just my taste. It's not a value judgment there, just what I would like to see. The pommel is peened to the tang, and it's got a small round peen block here. The peen is very nicely shaped, very round, and covers the gap entirely, but it's not cleaned up at all. You can see a lot of hammer marks on here. It's not polished, anything like that. Again, aesthetic choice. The transitions from the pommel to the grip are outstanding. While there, this little ring here definitely is definitely prominently sticking out away from the grip. It's shaped in such a way that there's absolutely no sharp ledges here at all. It's very comfortable to grip. The grip here is composed of four different parts. You've got two pieces of ebony and these two little spacers. These are also gilded bronze. And I believe this one up here would, could probably be called a ferrule, a spacer. Terminology doesn't really matter. These two pieces look beautiful. I love the way they flow through the hilt. And they're set into the grip very nicely. There's a slight bit of a ledge on this side, especially right here, but it's never bit into my hand. And if you look at the original, looks like it has at least as big of a ledge as this one. These two ebony pieces are carved into that beautiful rithening shape. And if you look at the close-ups here, you can probably see there's a crack or split on both of them. I'm not sure when that happened. When I first got it, I didn't see them. But when I was inspecting my video footage that I'm showing you, that's when I noticed them. And I asked Nate about them, and he said that he doesn't remember seeing them. So it's possible it happened during shipping. The video I took was before I did any testing with the sword. So, you know, my light use didn't cause it. Nate has used it quite a bit. So 
it's possible it came from use. I'm not really sure. I know some exotic hardwoods like to have oil applied to them from time to time to keep, to keep them um, from drying out and cracking. I believe ebony is one of those, especially if it has an oil finish, which this does. Nate has said that he has applied treatment to the wood. So how these formed, I don't really know. I don't think they are a fatal flaw in the grip though, because it's still holding together very well. And I asked a few people who are more knowledgeable about wood than I am about them. And they said the consensus seemed to be that this was not the maker's uh, fault, that it's likely just an exotic hardwood that, is, that developed some cracks. And it would probably be relatively easy to fix. Oiling the wood a little bit might help it expand and reduce the cracks. And you could probably fill the cracks with like some epoxy or even super glue, very lightly sand the wood to help it, while that's still wet, to help that sand, the, help the sawdust mix with the, the glue and basically blend in together. It doesn't seem to be that these are big problems. That said, it is disappointing on this expensive of a sword. And I want to reiterate that this is a well-used sword. These cracks were not there when it was new, and you wouldn't expect to receive it like that. The cross guard is, like the pommel, gilded bronze. And just like the pommel, there's a good number of casting flaws and pits and things like that. Again, just like the pommel, more than I would prefer at this price point. This little part right in the center has these grooves in it, just like the original, although these are much crisper and more defined than the original. That's, I assume, Todd, appealing to the modern aesthetic because I can see a lot of people, if they got the one that looked like the original, would be outraged at how rough those lines are. And if we look at where the blade meets the cross guard, it's pretty tightly fitted. However, you can also see that there is epoxy in there. And I'm calling it epoxy because I, I, it could be something else. It could be some kind of historical glue or resin or something. I'm just calling it epoxy because that's what I decided to call it. Now, this is kind of an interesting thing because just two weeks ago, I lambasted Dark Sword Armory for using epoxy in their hilt construction. And here we have a $5,000 sword that epoxy is visible. Am I going to do the same thing to Todd here? Well, no. Mostly. And why is that? What's the difference here? Well, first off, this is a vastly different hilt construction. We have a lot more parts. We have a pommel, a grip, a spacer, another piece of grip, another spacer, and the cross guard. There's a lot of components here which makes for a more delicate construction because there's just more spots to fail and more things to secure together. In addition, the way the sword fits into the blade is a completely, or the, the way the sword fits into the grass guard is a different type. The entire hilt, you know, there's no um, wood core with leather wrap and cord, all that to reinforce the entire grip. There's just uh, wood and a couple spacers, the hilt furniture on the tank. So it's a overall a more delicate hilt construction and using epoxy not to help secure those is not as bad as what Dark Sword Armory does which is use epoxy to fill in gaps. That's not what's being done here. This is a very it's it's all very tightly constructed and there's just not room for gaps because it's very slender and very uh refined. So Using epoxy to help secure things is a different thing than using epoxy to fill in gaps for sloppy hilt construction. Now, all that being said, I am going to criticize Todd here a little bit because especially if you look near the spacers, you can see the epoxy creeping out, slopping out onto the wood a little bit. I think that should have been cleaned up when this was made. I don't think you should be seeing that epoxy slop out onto the wood. And you know, my hunch is that the original sword has some kind of glue or resin in the cross guard here to help secure it as well. And 
I think it's also likely that that is there to help keep liquids from running down the blade into the cross guard and onto the tang where it would start rusting away at the blade and compromise it eventually. I am fully aware that this might sound hypocritical that I am criticizing Dark Sword Armory and not Todd here. And I hope I've explained why I think it's more acceptable here on this sword than it was on the DSA. If not, I apologize. That's my fault for not communicating it properly. And now it's time to talk about the business end, the blade. As always, here's my measurements. So this blade is slender. It starts at only one and a half inches wide, evenly tapering down the length of the blade to an acute point. It's robust, starting at 7.2 millimeters thick, with non-linear distal taper ending at 2.8 millimeters thick, two inches from the tip. The sword weighs in at just two pounds, 7.6 ounces, and is balanced at nearly three and a half inches. So that slenderness is why I consider this sword to be thrust focused. It doesn't really have the geometry to be a really super effective cutter. That's not to say it can't cut, we'll get to that in a few minutes, but it is certainly more oriented towards the thrust than the cut. Now, when you're looking at this sword, you're going to see scuffs, stains, uh, scratches. Those are not from the sword new. When Nate got it new, he told me the finish on it was roughly equivalent to Albion. However, Nate has used the sword a lot. He's cut a lot of targets with it, tatami, pumpkins, beach mats, even a four by four. So this sword has seen a lot of use and it shows that use. So th there's nothing to hold against Todd for the stains and scuffs and scratches. The finish from what I can see is uh, nice and even satin with all those scuffs marring it. One of the things I find really cool that Todd replicated is the way the sword actually curves into the cross guard a little bit. That is something you see on the original, as you can see here, and it's cool to see that Todd replicated it on this sword. Looking down the lengths of the blade, I can make out some very, very shallow and minor rippling. We're talking minuscule here to the point where it's, I almost didn't see it. So, at that, and that's fine. You know, a little bit of rippling, this is the least amount I've ever really noticed. So I don't consider it to be a problem. It's certainly not going to affect the functionality of the sword. At this price point, you definitely want to see that kind of thing cleaned up. At least I want to see it cleaned up. And I think the amount here is acceptable. The center ridge is very crisp and straight. There might be a very slight wobble to it here and there. Again, handmade, that kind of thing is going to be expected. But again, that may, that may not be acceptable to you at this price point. It's an aesthetic choice that you have to make. Nobody else can make that for you. If you look at the tip, it's very well formed. Pretty much no asymmetries there. And the cross section is, it's not reinforced, but the cross section, the way it's sharpened and the way the blade is shaped, it almost turns into a hexagonal cross section there at the tip. And the edge beveling here is excellent. It's one smooth bevel from the central ridge to the edge. You might see something of a secondary bevel or micro bevel here. That's not from Todd. Nate has done a lot of stropping of the sword, which can over time create that. And he might have resharpened it. He wasn't sure if he did a full resharpening or just stropping. But in any case, he's done a lot of stropping on it. And when you do that with Jeweler's Compound, you are still do, removing small, tiny amounts of metal. So that over time, that can create a secondary bevel. And it's very minor here. All right, let's do some paper cutting to test the edge. It's important to note that this is not the edge that you would get direct from Todd. There's a re the reason I do paper cutting much of the time is that it can provide context to how well the sword cuts. If a sword that I determine has a very sharp edge through paper cutting and it still doesn't do particularly good cutting, well, part of that's gonna be my fault, always, always, because I am by no means a great cutter. But it can also tell me that even though it may have a really good edge, if it doesn't cut that well, maybe the sword's not that good of a cutter. On the other hand, if a sword isn't particularly sharp and still cuts pretty decently, 
that generally implies that it is at least a decent cutter by the design. So let's see how this sword does. Was completely unable to bite into the paper there. I always like to do this several times to because it can fail one time because I have the alignment off or whatever. It's instructive to do it multiple times. So that was not even really a bite. That was more of a tear there. So it did bite in way up here and then it cut through pretty smoothly. Let me test the other edge now. And for reasons that I will get into during the handling section, this is what I would consider the true edge, the, the primary cutting edge. Completely failed to bite into the paper there. Okay, it bit in there and cut and was pretty smoothly cutting there. Yeah, there's definitely one spot up right around the percussion node where it is sharp enough to bite into the paper, and then it kind of struggles. I want to try doing just inserting the sword in and seeing how smooth it cuts through. So it's cutting there, but it's not as cleanly slicing as I would like to see. So the sword is effectively sharp, but not particularly sharp. All right, cutting. I did a small amount of cutting with this sword. Nate asked me to keep it to light targets, so water bottles it is. I also did some thrusting, and I tried a new setup with this where I was dangling the targets from above, and I like how this worked out because it gives the target a little bit more support than just putting it on my stand and thrusting into it. So this sword is a very accurate and easy to use thruster. And for me personally, I am not at all accurate when I'm thrusting. And I still missed some with this sword. There's no doubt about that. But more often than not, I was able to get the sword on target and that's better odds than I normally manage. On easy targets like the normal water bottles I cut, this sword penetrates deeply and with pretty much no resistance at all. That's what I would expect. These targets are very easy to thrust into. On harder targets like this soap bottle, which is a soft plastic but very thick plastic, it penetrates pretty well and gets all the way through. And it didn't really take a lot of force to do that. And then on this syrup bottle, which is not particularly thick, but very hard plastic, once again, it penetrates through very easily, very effectively, and this was nowhere near full force. So this is a very effective thruster. Now, in terms of cutting, it cuts pretty well. Better than I was expecting, honestly. You know, this geometry is not particularly conducive to cutting because the edge angle is not, is gonna be pretty obtuse because it has it's pretty thick out here and there's not a lot of width to bring that angle into a more acute angle. But it still cuts through every target I put in front of it. It didn't tear through, it cut all the way through. And I didn't have a single cut where I didn't make it through. You know, that's really all I can ask for for a thrust focused sword. I wasn't able to get any silent cuts with this sword, but that's, again, unsurprising. And honestly, a more skilled cutter, I am confident, would get a lot more silent cuts. So all in all, this is a fun and effective cutter and thruster. So let's talk about handling. And I wanna start by talking about how it feels to hold this grip, how it feels to move the sword around. So this is a very slender grip and just very elegant, delicate. Uh, it, I, I can't quite come up with the right word for it, but it's not large, let me just put it that way but it feels really, really good. It's got a very unique feel to it. And normally I don't like particularly slender grips, but it works here. I think that rhythming of the wood is doing a lot of work to really make this feel good. So while it is not my normal preferred style, it does work quite well. And there's just something elegant about the way 
the hilt interacts with the hand. I'm not sure exactly how to describe it other than it feels extremely elegant, extremely refined. Now, the pommel, because it, it is not symmetrical, you know, this part here sticks out some and it doesn't do the same on the other side of the blade. This sword kind of, for me, has a true edge and a false edge baked into it because if I'm holding it where that comes out like this, I can't really hold it particularly comfortably because the pommel kind of butts up in my hand and weakens my grip. Whereas if I hold it like this, hopefully you can see that, I can, I can grip it very solidly and it's very, very, very comfortable. So for me at least, this is the true edge. This is the false edge. I don't like gripping it like this with the protrusion in my hand. Although I can say, if I want to use the sword one-handed, doesn't matter which side. And the sword is very usable one-handed. It weighs right around two and a half pounds. It's very maneuverable. There's some tip presence out there, but not a ton. I can easily guide the tip where I want it to go, which makes sense because this is, with how thin with how narrow the blade is, this is very much a thrust focus sword as I talked about before. So two and a half pounds balanced. If I remember right, it's right around three and a half inches. Very agile, very easy to move around. Some blade presence, but not a lot. And just really nice. And hopefully you can hear it. This sword has a lot of Tache Kaze, sword wind. It, it really gives you good feedback when you have your edge alignment on. It really does cut through the air and give you that sound so that you know your edge alignment is on. All right, I'm going to do two comparisons for this sword. One that is pretty similar and one that is pretty different. So here we have the Todd's Workshop and here we have the Vision Tauber. You've seen me do a good number of comparisons to this sword because it's just one of my favorites. And if you look at these you can see that they are very different profiles. The tower starts wider and maintains that width much more than the Rift and Hilt sword does. So this is going to be a much more cut focus sword while still maintaining a good amount of thrust ability because it does get to a quite a cute tip. Let me put down the Rift and Hilt sword. So the tower weighs two pounds, 12 ounces, the Rift and Hilt two and a half pounds about. And they feel pretty similar. This definitely has a lot of, has some extra weight. I can feel more blade presence to it and just a bit more sturdy feel to the entire thing. It just feels a little bit more there in the hand. It is not as loud as the Riffin is, but it still does give you a little bit of feedback. And it has a little bit worse tip control, not a lot but it doesn't feel quite as natural as the Riffin does for thrusting. The balance point looks like it's probably around four inches. So a little bit more blade presence just based off that, but also just because it's got extra weight to it, it feels a little bit more authoritative in the cut, a little bit more solid. That's not to say that the Riffin here doesn't feel solid. It does. It feels like it's going to cut through what it needs to cut through and have enough authority to do the job it wants to do. But it feels like it has exactly just enough and with absolutely no extra. Whereas the Tauber has a bit more authority to it, a bit more, just, it feels a bit more like it's going, it's designed for a lot of use and a lot of cutting and perhaps even war. Whereas this feels much more like a sword that is intended to be used, but at the same time, not really intended to be a war sword. You know, it's intended to be a riding sword. That's my impression of it, at least. So the other sword I'm going to compare to the Riffin is this Cloudhammer S7 sword. This is not something that you can easily get because I don't know that they actually make these all the time. They, Cloudhammer does have something they call an armor piercer on their website in stock right now. 
and it looks superficially similar to this, so it might be kind of similar. But I chose this sword because you can see it has much the same design goal as the Rithin, in that it is narrow and tapers pretty evenly to a very acute point. It definitely is a thrust-focused sword, and the overall hilt is approximately the same size. And I should mention that this is not the grip this sword came with. I had it rewrapped because I didn't like the cord wrap it had. I wanted a more traditional leather wrap on it. So this sword is even lighter at two pounds, four ounces. Incredibly light for a two-handed sword. And honestly, this doesn't feel like a two-handed sword. It feels like a one-handed sword with a long grip that can be used two-handed. So in some ways, it reminds me of a Chinese Jian because a lot of Jian have blades that are, or hilts that are longer than they need to be for one-handed use, but they could be used two-handed. So while this is a European style sword, it's kind of a blend between that and a Jian. But anyways, so very, very light, very little blade presence here. The tip doesn't really have any weight to it at all. If we look at the balance point, it's about two and a half inches, maybe three. So very much a thrust focused sword and yeah, tip control is very good. All of the weight of the sword feels like it's back here and especially in the hilt. The blade itself doesn't feel like there's much to it at all. It can still cut, it still has some width here. In fact, I think it actually has a little bit more width out here at the percussion point than the Rithin does. So maybe even a little bit more cut focused than the Rithin, but it's got some Tachikaze too, a little bit less than the Rithin, but a little bit more than the Tower. And overall, very light, very nimble sword that is feels pretty similar to the Rithin, except that the Rithin, despite this having a little bit more blade width and probably a little bit better cutting ability, the Rithin has a bit more blade presence, so it feels like it's going to help power through a cut a little bit more. Not a lot, we're not talking about a lot of differences here, but that's the way it feels to me. And yeah, when I pick up the Rithin again, I can feel some weight out here that I couldn't really feel on the Cloud Hammer. But this is also a longer blade, and that's probably what's accounting for that, because this is not, this is still pretty stout out here, as was the Cloud Hammer. I don't have the measurements, but it has distal taper, but it stays relatively thick. A lot like this, although this does get pretty thin out here, and it does flex some, but not a lot. There's not a lot of flex to the sword as you would kind of expect for a thrust focus sword. This is definitely usable one-handed, pretty much as easily as it is two-handed. And due to that, the pommel like that, it's a little bit easier to use because I don't have to be conscious of that pommel there. I can just move the sword out here very easily. I think this sword could very easily be used one-handed at pretty much all times and it would not bother me at all to use it like that. Let's talk about the bottom line. I skipped over potential improvements because this is not really a production sword. It's much closer to something that is bespoke. Yes, Todd has it listed as a model you can buy, but these are all handmade and individual and they're going to have variants and it just doesn't feel to me like potential improvements make sense for this sword. So this sword and scabbard costs roughly $5,500. What do you get for that price? Well, you get something handmade by Todd, a very well-known craftsman and something of a minor celebrity in some circles. You get a very close replica of an iconic historical artifact. You get a scabbard that is very typical for Todd's work, a sword that is beautiful and is a very dedicated thruster that retains more ability to cut than I would have expected. And you get a sword that exhibits a lot of the medieval aesthetic while still managing to appeal to modern taste. And if you opt for the ebony and gilded hilt furniture, like on this one, you get something that is blinged out, 
while still looking classy. So is it worth that $5,500 price tag? Well, that is a hard question to answer. First off, what are you looking for? As a backyard cutter, no. I would not say this is worth it. This, I would argue that there are far more cost-effective swords that are better backyard cutters that are not going to have this level of ornateness, but for a backyard cutter, you don't really need that. Now, what about if this is going to be the crown jewel of your collection? Now we're getting somewhere. That, I can absolutely see this sword fulfilling that role and being worth that price, especially if this entire look speaks to you as deeply as it obviously speaks to the Levin Lance. So it really does come down to what you want out of the sword. For me personally, while I think this is an absurdly beautiful sword, I love the craftsmanship, I love the look, I love the feel, I really enjoy this sword. It's not worth it for me because it doesn't speak to me on that deep level that it would need to to justify this price point. You know, for $5,500, I could get something like a Munich from Mateusz Sulowski, which would, would be a very highly decorated sword. And that speaks to me more than this does to, than, than this sword does. That's not to say, that's not a criticism of this sword, not at all. It's just not quite, it doesn't quite speak to me on that level. You know, for something that is going to be over $5,000, I wanted to really grab me and say, you must own me. And that's not what this does to me. I really like the sword, but it's not deeply ingrained in my psyche. It's not something that I have to be like, I want that so badly. It's just, that's not my taste. It's not to say I can't appreciate it. I do. I really, I really do love the way this looks. Just not quite to that level. But if it does speak to you like that, and you can justify this kind of price tag on one sword, then yeah, I do think it's worth it but not for me. And that's going to wrap up this review. I want to give a huge thank you to my friend Eleven Lance for loaning me such a beautiful and expensive sword for the purposes of this review. Thank you, Nate. It is greatly appreciated. For my viewers, make sure you check out his channel where he posts videos about a variety of projects he's involved in. The link to his channel is in the description. While you're there, make sure you hit the like button, subscribe, all that jazz. Until next time, Alien 2 Dow.